Father, thank you for your presence, enliven our spirits, our minds, that we may receive afresh your living word into our lives and into our church. Amen. Three sons left home and went out on their own, and each one prospered. Getting back together, they discussed the gifts they were able to give to their elderly mother. The first said, I built a big house for our mother. The second said, I sent her a Mercedes with a driver. The third smiled and said, I've got you both beat. You remember how mum enjoyed reading the Bible? And you know she can't see very well? I sent her a remarkable parrot that recites the entire Bible. It took the elders in the church 12 years to teach the bird. He's one of a kind. Mum just has to name the chapter and verse and the parrot recites it. Soon thereafter, Mum sent out her letters of thanks. Milton, she wrote one son, The house you built is so huge, I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole house. Gerald, she wrote to another, I am too old to travel. I stay most of the time at home, so I rarely use the Mercedes, and the driver is so rude. Dearest Donald, she wrote to the third son, you have the good sense to know what mother really likes. The chicken was delicious. <laughs> Jesus' parable of the sower and the seed is a parable revered for centuries and especially loved by the church because the question the disciples and we ask is, if God's word is a word of life and salvation and power, a word that can heal, rescue and revive, then why is it getting such a mixed response? Why aren't all people embracing and absorbing the word of God? So Matthew responds with Jesus' parable of the sower. One day, a farmer went out to sow. Evidently, back then, there were two methods of planting. One of them used an ox to pull a plough and slowly the seeds spilled out row by row. The other method is just scatter the seed far and wide all over the place. It is this second method of scattering the seed to which the Lord refers. Some seed fell on the road, some on rocky ground, some on thorn bush covered ground, and some on good ground. The seed, the message that Jesus gives us is packed with power and salvation, especially for a world which St Paul says in the second reading is groaning for redemption, from release from the grip of sin. The seed is good, the difference lies in the ground where it falls. I've had an exciting couple of days back where I live because last year I had the privilege of baptising two adult young men. One of them had hardly any Christian background at all and the other came from a New Zealand family where that parish wouldn't baptise children until they were old enough like the Baptist or you've got to be old enough on your own volition to make a decision for Christ. So the 21-year-old from a very deeply Christian family 
was prepared and very careful about coming to the lessons. The other guy is about 30 and has been married three times already and has about five children by this, that and the other. He used to forget to turn up and I, I, I prayed and I prayed and I thought, you know, this is hard work, Lord. But anyway, coming back from my gym on the bike on Friday morning, my treat after that exercise and being with the physio is to buy a cup of coffee in a coffee van on the way back. Lo and behold, here's this guy, Josh, at the coffee van. And he fell on me like a long lost friend. And, you know, sometimes you can put a lot of effort into someone and it looks like it's gone absolutely nowhere. You sow the seed and it looks like it's gone on the road and chum, gone. But this guy just fell on me because God used me to speak into his life. There's, there's a long way to go. His, I, I think it's his ex-wife was with him and, and, and we just had a really good conversation and exchanged telephone numbers and I need to get back involved in that. And then I think yesterday morning I went out with the church warden from um, Petrie, whose son, who's about to go off to some clever computer job um, in Sydney when, when COVID will allow him to do that. And here's this lovely James just flourishing and, and going on in the word of God and, and, and coming from a stable background. So sometimes we're called to sow the seeds in peculiar environments and sometimes you think, oh, this, is, this is a waste of time, Lord. But we need to sow the seed in season and out of season. And every baptised person is called to this. And, and, and some ministry is very rewarding and, and, and there's just beautiful growth before your eyes. And other seems to be cut off before it's hardly on the road. But we're all called. We all, well, most of us have children and grandchildren for better or for worse, and you can sow in prayer and into their lives on a daily basis and pray that they'll come into contact with the Word of God. So, sometimes preachers and the baptised who are doing ministry need comfort. A preacher does the best you can, but people receive a sermon differently. Some are the pavement. For them, the sermon is a time to time out. I had a guy in one parish whom I really like and respect, and when the sermon time got to a certain point, up would come the arm out of the pews, and it would be a message like this, and it was very determined. I, I, you know, he was a very successful business person, and I liked him and his wife immensely, but I didn't find that action particularly helpful, but still it happened. <clears throat> they never apply it to themselves, but to others. You know, it's, when you get into ministry, you can always be solving other people's things, but sometimes God wants to solve something in you. And, and we all need to be humble enough to keep on growing whatever age we are. Others are like the rock where the seed has no roots as people look for passion, oratorical fireworks and hype, and afterwards go back to business as usual. The word among the thorns can be people who have a running debate with the preacher. He used this word, not that. He's too harsh, too fuzzy, too conservative, too liberal, too academic, too devotional, too long or too short. At St Luke's Toowoomba, I, I had this person who'd been in charge of everything all of her life and she used to love to tell me once that when she was travelling in country Queensland this priest stood up and preached his sermon in under one minute and it was a very um, shafted thing towards me that I took a lot longer than one minute to preach the word of God every Sunday <coughs> but I kept on. 
So we can apply the truth of this parable not only to preachers but to parents and friends. When something happens to a family member or a friend after we've given them help and advice and they still do something destructive, we instinctively ask where we went wrong. All you and I can do is sow the seed by word and example as best we can. That's what the Lord expects the church, the preacher, parents and friends to do. After that, there is this mysterious chemistry between the seed and the soil that takes over. When we get to heaven, we'll probably be surprised what use our prayers were along the way in this life, because you can see it from a different perspective then. So, dear people, what sort of soil are we? Are we the pavement where God's word stays on the surface and anything can distract us from the word? Or are we the rock that never lets God's word sink in deeply? Do we reduce our faith to feelings and nice thoughts and never let it shape our life in any serious way? Are we filled with thorns, interests, addictions, distractions and other priorities and unchanneled drives that choke off the word of God in our lives. The question is not whether we hear the word of God in our life, we do. It comes through scripture and through the liturgy. But do we respond to it? Do we embrace it? Do we let it take root and grow in our lives? What kind of soil are we? What kind of soil is this parish with the new priest that God's calling here? The point of this parable is that when the seed falls on good soil, it, it lets out roots and shoots and produces a terrific harvest of 30, 60 and 100 grains for the one that was sown. A bonanza! I think this parish is hopefully ready for a bonanza. Of, of growth and, and blessing and God's anointing. Faith in Christ is handed on and the church grows. All that we see in the church, schools, Anglicare, parishes, the commitment of so many people to the work of the gospel are products of seed in good soil. I have, I, in at my little house, I've inherited nice boxes from the people before me with soil in them, and I've had an incredible um, crop of parsley that all came up, and, and lots of a listen, so it's all going out into the garden, and I put some on the footpath, and I'm going to put up a sign for the passers by, if you want some, have some, because the parsley's growing up thick and luxurious. A, a wonderful response, and, and we need that in the church, to sow this living seed of the gospel into lives in this community of the gap and, and, and see lives young and old and in between be altered by the love of the living God. 
Judge the power of the seed, not by the seed that falls on the pavement, rock or thorns, but by the seed that falls on good ground. Judge the power of God's word, not by the nominal Christians, but by what it does in the lives of those who deeply embrace the word of Christ. Judge the church, not by its sinners, but by its saints. That's where we see the real power of God's word. We can become so preoccupied and frustrated with the seed that fails that we need this parable to remind us of the seed that falls on good ground. We forget the growing that's going on all the time because things grow quietly. The message to us is to sow the best we can, to spread Christ's word as effectively and honestly as we know how to and leave the rest to the mysterious chemistry between seed and soil. Some will take root and that will make the sowing worthwhile and there will be a harvest from the seed we have sown. We are to keep sowing no matter how the soil may look because we never know where it will take root and produce a harvest and a changed life that will in turn change others. I think I've shared this story before but I think it's relevant today. In about the late 1980s I took an RE class in the Caloundra High School for a year. There was swearing, fighting, tipping up desks. I used to go there and think, dear God, do I have to do this? <laughs> but I did it. And at the end of that year, I was moved to another part of the Sunshine Coast and I thought, that's over. I, I went there prayerfully. I, I sought to share the faith. And you know, 10 years later, I was walking through Kurong Books in Wollongabba, and this young man comes rushing up to me and taps me on the shoulder and he says, are you Mr Sligo? And I thought, Oh, should I own up here? And I gingerly said, yes. He said, did you teach RI in the, in the Caloundra High School 10 years back? I said, yes. He said, I gave my life to the Lord through those classes and I'm now a missionary in Russia. Sometimes in the most difficult circumstances, God is doing something powerful. And if we pull back and always want to be in a comfort zone, we're not going to push the word of God out there where it needs to be. And it, just one life that can be powerfully changed by the gospel, which is the greatest reality in this earth, it makes it all worthwhile. So, dear people, so widely and generously, and indeed, there will be a harvest. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the seed of the gospel that's fallen into our lives. Thank you for your love, your salvation, your goodness, and, and the growth that happens. Help St. Mark's to be a conveyor of the truth of the gospel so that lives, young and old, can be altered, recreated and blessed. For Jesus' sake. Amen.